Where we last left off, our group of adventurers found themselves in a strange lair, surrounded by blood, gore, and death. They banded together to escape, managing to find two of their captors on the upper floors. But alas, both of the odd cultists escaped their grasp. Our party now finds themselves in a dense forest, with no idea how close or far they are to their ultimate destination of Mesophonus. As they all stand, emerging out of the inconspicuous trapdoor that hides the dungeon they just escaped, they find themselves surrounded by untamed nature. To their right roars a waterfall that breaks on the rocky shore, while the left lends itself to more forestry. Amdar has spent years in the woodlands, though these are unfamiliar sights to him. Still, his wood elven heritage has landed him a high degree of competence when it comes to navigating these thick areas of forestry. He leads the party, following the stream away from the waterfall, for he knows he's bound to run into civilization along this banks sooner or later. The party is still gripped with a sense of unease. Who were those people who captured them? What unholy schemes were they trying to unveil? No answers seem evident to the party, and for now, it's just a mystery. Eventually, as the travel continues, the thick trees cut away as Amdar spots a bridge branching over the stream that the party is trekking along. On it, he spots a strange sight, a giant mammal of sorts with deep orange skin, almost completely smooth. It is big and round. On the creature leans an old woman, frizzled hair and wild appearance, with as many liver spots on her face as wrinkles. Amdar puts his hands up and stops the party. What's our plan here? Find out where we are, Mike responds. What about the cultist? Quintin offers. I wouldn't want to place our trust in trainers on that front, Durden responds. Agreed. We've escaped. It's not our priority anymore. What matters most to me now is getting to Mesophonus. Something doesn't sit right with me about that whole situation. But still, the sooner we get to Mesophonus, the better. The party cautiously makes their way to the bridge, approaching the thin old woman and whatever her giant swollen pet seemed to be. Oh ho ho, does granny have gentlemen suitors once more? The old woman starts. My, what handsome men have come to granny. You should have washed up first though. It is bad manners to be covered in the stench of death. Durden readies his weapons and is met with a giant mammal instantly perking up, bearing two massive tusks ready to pounce. Durden asks her hesitantly, how did you know that? Oh, don't worry, dear. Granny can only know what she knows. She reads it in the tea leaves, hears it in the wind, and sees it in her crystals. Granny knows that you have many questions that have waded through debt to come see her. You're a diviner, Amdar asks. He's read about the divination schools of magic. He also knew of those gifted naturally with the knowledge and vision to divine. Indeed, Granny crackles, leaning once more on the giant animal next to her. The party stares at each other. Come on, ask your questions. Granny's not going to live forever. Well, I'll ask what we're all wondering, Quinton offers. What is that thing? He says, pointing to the giant orange beast. Ah, Floppy, Granny's hornless hippopotamus. Granny raised him since he was a calf, she did. Amdar thinks to himself for a second. He hadn't seen one in person before, but he was sure he had read books on them. Aren't all hippopotamuses hornless? Mike brushes away the topic of conversation. Never mind that. Where are we? You're in Wicker's Grove, my boy. Southern tip of Greenwood Forest. The only thing around here for miles is the university and untamed nature. Wicker's Grove, Mike thinks to himself. He's further away from Mesophonus than before. How do we get to Mesophonus? Durden inquires. Mesophonus, Granny asked, alarm. Granny wouldn't recommend going there. Why? I, I thought it was a super cool and rich city, uh, Quinton asks. Oh, it has wealth. Too much, in fact. That wealth only breeds greed and avarice. Granny sees a dark omen over Mesophonus, an ill fate for all who venture there. The group looks at each other. They're all planning on making the journey to the City of Dreams. Granny continues, The city one day will be showered in blood, fury raining on its citizens. From the diplomats to the destitute, they will all find themselves drenched in the ichor of misfortune. 
How do we stop this? Amdar asked. Blind the eyes! Render their sight useless. Soon the flightless bird will soar, driven by envy. In its crash, the path will be revealed. Follow the trail promised by the usurper. That's very cryptic. Can you not tell us anything more? Mike asks. Granny knows what Granny knows. I still need to get there no matter what. Do you know how I could make the journey? I also have questions that can only be answered in Masophonis. My holy mission begins there. I cannot abandon it. Amdar, however, stays silent. Granny has told you what she knows. Your responsibility is yours alone. If you wish to travel to Masophonis, find a guide to brave the Greenwood Forest. Where do we find a guide? Amdar asked. Granny knows only what she knows. Go ask someone else. The party looks at each other. The strange old woman had answers, but they were not the questions they had. She did mention something of a university, though. Hopefully, they would have more luck there. With that, the party depart from the bridge. They follow what looks to be a well-traveled path until they eventually spot two large towers in the distance, a true sign of civilization. Unlike, well, an old woman and a hippo on a bridge. Getting closer, they get a better view of the area. There is a simple cobble path which snakes along the ground. They notice a number of small houses, all constructed with simple materials and rather rudimentary layouts. Their attention is more affixed to the two massive towers that lay on either side of the road. One tower is built with massive stone blocks, somewhat weathered and aged. Simple openings dot the length of the tower, letting air naturally ventilate in. On its very top is a conical roof, topped by an impressive dragon-like gargoyle of sorts that seems to overlook the entire campus, eyes seemingly following our party as they travel closer. The other tower is built with more modern brick-like materials. The windows are beautifully constructed art pieces stained to depict historical events. The roof is a vibrant red octagonal star, each inner vertex intersecting and layering on itself. Oddly, the party notices that the area appears to be rather empty. The only person they spot is a short, dwarvish man with a braided salt and pepper beard, wearing a leather cap and whistling to himself as he rakes the leaves. Durian walks over to the dwarf and offers a greeting. Look, brother, mind telling me where we are? The dwarf joins the friendly greeting. Ah, yet. You're in the Archivist University, friend. It's the middle of Sin, though. We're still closed this time of year. The party stirs in recognition. Oh, this is the Archivist University, a bastion of knowledge where many are trained in the methods of collecting and preserving information, exploring the long and storied history of Proterra. Amdar, especially, has heard much of this university. Third only to the College of Arcana and Purple Rock District of Masophonis, the Archivist University is a trove for arcade knowledge. Many come to peruse its great library, which the party recognizes as the red octagonal topped building, but are often unable to secure tutelage in the main halls. Durden asks, Any idea how we could get to Masophonis? The dwarf lays his hands on the butt of his rake as he considers. Hmm, you're quite far. The best option would be to go to a Baron's Red Crossing and take a boat there to Sveth's Bay so that you can dock in Masophonis. Durden frowns. Hmm, that is quite far. The dwarf responds. Aye, it is. You'd have to go around and pass Sambar's domain, which might risk stumbling on the war. The dwarf pauses and notices Durden's half fled insignia. Baron's Red is a brood control fort. Uh, I'd advise being not so brazen about your allegiances. Durden looks at his badge of honor, worn through the exploits during the siege of Potelmi. He would keep it on for now, but his pride did not constitute stupidity. He would remove it when the time came. Uh, thanks for the word of advice. Uh, what if you would try to bisect the forest, maybe, and cross straight through Greenwood? Uh, the dwarf stumbles back in shock. You've cut your journey from weeks to just five days, but still, that's if you don't get lost or meet the many creatures of the forest. It's dangerous. Mike interjects the conversation. What if we were to find a guide to lead us through? The dwarf sighs. Well, it's, it's possible, but it's still dangerous. It might stop you from getting lost, but it won't shield you from the wildlife. I think there's a druid tribe around there somewhere, but I don't know where. Abner asks. Any idea who might know? The dwarf pauses. Well, the senior archivist would know, but uh, he's a busy man. I doubt he'd be able to meet you, especially for just a question like this. Mike smiles. 
The burnished bronze scales around his mouth reveal a pearly white set of teeth. Now, I didn't catch your name. The dwarf answers cautiously. Uh, it's Rahan. I'm the head groundskeeper here. Mike continues. Rahan, you look like you've been a groundkeeper here for a while. Uh, yeah, yes I have. And that loyalty doesn't go unrewarded. I'm sure. And now I'm a man who's sure of many things, but this more than others. I'm sure the senior archivist respects your word and your counsel. Uh, are, you, are you sure? He's a pretty intelligent man. I, I don't know what I could offer him. He sure is. He has to be to become the senior archivist. He spends all his time reading books, all his time researching. But, Rahan, he doesn't have what you have. He doesn't have the practical smarts that you do. He appointed you as the head groundskeeper for a reason, Rahan. And that means something. That's something that he couldn't do himself. The dwarf strokes his beard for a second. Huh, I, I never thought of it that way. Yeah, that's the thing, Rahan. I'm sure you have it, but you hold a lot more sway than you think you do. Hmm, huh, you're right. So, Rahan, I know we just met, but could you do one small favor for my group and I? Uh, I'll, I'll try. Could you just try and see if you could get us five minutes of the senior archivist time? He's a busy man, I know. We won't be a bother. I promise. The dwarf looks for a second, deep in thought. Fine, I'll see what I can do. I usually debrief at the end of the day after I finish my duties, but if you could help me finish them faster, I could see if I could go meet with the senior archivist earlier. Mike smiles. Of course, Rahan. Tell me what I need to do for you. The rest of the group watches in awe as the eight-foot-tall dragonborn clad in near-black scales with clawed fingers and a massive warhammer hanging off his hip just managed to ooze charisma to charm his way into achieving what they thought was impossible. Maybe Mike had more talents than they realized. Well, the rest of the tasks are easy. I'm just concerned because I've been hearing some sounds in our archive basement recently. Last time I was down there, I had to grapple with the giant rats and I'm no warrior. I'd certainly appreciate it if you could take a look for me. We can certainly do that, Mike winks as he gestures a hand for Han to lead the way. The groundskeeper leads them to the basement of the university, descending down a path at the steps of the old stone building. He pulls out a massive keyring before unlocking the door and letting the party through. Uh, I hope it's nothing, but if it is, I just need to make sure it's not eating through our archives, Rahan offers. He nervously pauses. Uh, I, I still need to prune the bushes and tend to the herb garden. Uh, tell me what you clear out this place. <laughs> Rahan quickly ascends back upstairs. The party emerges into a dusty basement with a number of rickety tables set all around the floor. There are no lights here, leading to a difficult situation for Mike and Quinton, both of whom who are not blessed with a dark vision unlike the dwarven Durden and the elvish Omdar. For their benefit, Durden pulls out a torch from his pack, making sure the flames are nowhere near the important documents. Oddly coming into focus, at the very end of the room, a number of books lay open on the table. A number of pages are ripped out and tossed around the room. Amdar feels a sense of uneasiness. Something here makes him feel like he's being watched. A voice gurgles in the head of the wolf elf wizard. Mage. Who's there? Amdar shouts out. The rest of the party looks at him strangely. A figure begins to slink out of the shadows at the far end of the room. One large, piercing, and baleful eye peers out of the party, a gleam reflecting off the light of the torch indicating a malicious intelligence the creature possesses. The creature that appears has a thin and haggardly body, discolored with the various lesions and tags on its arms and legs. Its back is lined with dagger-like spikes, and its hands and fingers have three clawed nails each but the party can only focus on the solitary large eye seemingly piercing into their very souls. Mike clutches his holy symbol while Durden and Quinton reach for their weapons. The same voice bubbles in each of their heads. You seek knowledge. I seek it too. What unholy creature are you? Mike demands. The creature smiles, revealing a razor-sharp set of teeth underneath its single green eyeball. It does not open its mouth, yet the voice froths in each of their heads once more. A seeker of secrets. I see each of you. 
a spoiled child who left his nest, a lonely soul who craves purpose, a lover who could not save his love, and a faithless man on a mission of faith. Everyone in the party pauses. How did it know that? I want information. And all of you want power. I offer a trade. There is a scroll in the great library, sealed with a symbol of a trident. Bring it to me, and I shall grant you an item of great power. Well, what do you want this for? Durden asks, still clutching his weapons. The creature slinks down and pulls out an inscribed vase from underneath the table, brimming with a dull red light, indicating some odd magical enchantment. My reasons are squarely my own. I offer you a deal. It is your choice to accept it. The party looks at each other nervously. If Greenwood is truly as dangerous as they think, it would be useful to have an item that would aid them. Amdar pipes up. I'll get you that page. The creature bears its razor-sharp teeth in a twisted snarl once more. I'll be waiting. Amdar continues. But once I do, you leave this place. You've clearly read it all. You have no need of this knowledge. The smile of the creature drops. It tilts its head and squares its shoulders. Fulfill your obligation to me. We can discuss more once you return. It pounces away from the table it stood on, slinking away from the light of Durden's torch back into the darkness. The party looks at each other. Rahan had already told them that the Great Library was closed. They knew that they would be agreeing to steal from Archivist University. Durden pauses. We don't have to honor any deals with that creature. What's most important is getting to Masophonus. How do we make sure we get there in one piece? I think that magic item is worth the trouble, Amdar offers. Durden groans. He does not like breaking the law. He looks over at the rest of the party, remembering the cutting words the creature told him. Was Amdar the lonely soul who craves purpose? He had agreed to travel with the party, but just hoped it wouldn't lead to compromising his morals down the line. He was a soldier. He knew the importance of following the laws. Even he acknowledges that they're sometimes meant to be broken, like the draconic missives by the broods. He gave a frustrated sigh. Durden signaled for the group to lead the way. The party continues further up the stairs, emerging once more into the courtyard, though this time hiding behind the large building. Quinton scouts out for Rahan, who, luckily for them, is nowhere to be found. The party sneaks over to the massive red building. Trying the door, it's clear it's locked. The university is closed after all. Umbra spots an open window nearby and signals to Durden to stand below it. Before he can, Quinton does a quick acrobatic roll on the ground and springs up 10 feet to catch the bottom of the window, climbing within. Durden manages to boost Umbra into the building. Mike and Durden stand outside, keeping guard in case Rohan shows up. Umbra and Quinton are greeted by an amazing sight. The great library opens into a massive hall where a number of beautifully finished wooden plinths adorn the sides of large tables, each of which are dedicated with inscriptions of lore. None of the lanterns that line the walls are lit now, but still the natural sunlight filters through the various stained glass windows, painting gorgeous scenes to the floor. At the end of the hallway, though, is a roaring brazier, which illuminates much of the room. The flame in the brazier is a light blue, and a number of loose pages and scrolls seem to flow in a twister swirling in the faux flames of the brazier. It is clear that some powerful magic is achieving this effect. All across the walls are a number of books laying on shelves, all arranged in a perfectly symmetrical pattern. Amdar is floored by the amount of knowledge contained in these walls alone, much less the rest of the great library. So much lore is stored here that it would take a lifetime to read it. Mike peeks his head above the window, also spotting the magnificent brazier. He feels a slight crackle of energy reverberate through his back. Pay attention, Durden calls out. Rahan can come here any second. Mike snaps his head away from the library, focusing his attention towards the surrounding of Archivist University instead of the odd sensation he just felt. Amdar knows he should take a look for the scroll, but he's so tempted by all the knowledge that he decides to take a quick second to just pour through some of it. He signals to Quintin to look for the Tritum stamp parchment instead. Quinton begins his search by pulling out books off the shelves, trying to see if any of them are stamped with the trident. As the books land on the floor, they magically realign themselves into a neat pile, almost automatically stocking one on top of the other. Quinton would be impressed, but he's too busy trying to find this trident. He pulls one book down, and then another, and then another, and then another. 
Meanwhile, Amdar is looking through a book on monster lore. His curiosity was piqued. What was that odd creature in the basement of the archive? Mike and Durden nervously look around, still keeping an eye out for Rahad. Quinton continues to pull out books, one after the other, taking quick glances to see that none of them have this trident he's looking for. Amdar is deep in reading. His eye gets caught in a passage on the book before him. Nothics, it reads. Twisted, strange abominations with erratic tendencies. Do not be fooled by their brief moments of clarity, for a harsh grip of insanity holds over their minds. Originally formed by all manner of arcanists who seek forbidden knowledge, their hubris transforms them into malcontented creatures, filled with a malicious desire to hoard and consume knowledge. Their insanity may rear its head at any moment, filling their thoughts with gibbering nonsense and turning them evil. Still, sometimes bits of knowledge surface, revealing the deep intelligence which is obscured by evil. On the page is an illustration of a creature, very much like the creature they found in the basement of the university. Amdar wonders if the deal he had got the party into was an intelligent one. He needed to get more arcane knowledge. What would be the point of his journey out of the home tree otherwise? He thought of his parents, his siblings, the gentle hum of his sister Zelda as she crafted fingers of the Seldarine, the playful laughs of his brother Apple as he stalked up trees, the harsh twang of his brother Aaron's bow whenever he was out for a hunt. Amdar left all of that behind to pursue arcane knowledge, guided by his mentor Serdin, against the wishes of his family. He would not let it be for nothing. Quinton sighed, exasperated. He pulled out so many books already. Where could that trident scroll be? As he leaned on the bookshelf to collect his thoughts, his sight is once more drawn towards the swirling cluster of scrolls and pages bathed in the blue flame of the massive brazier that heads this library. Hello, Quinton thinks to himself. The trident scroll is sure to be there. Quinton dances over to the brazier, standing in front of the roaring blue flame but feeling no heat. Instead, there is a calming sense of ease and a light static crackle on his skin. Quinton looks inside the brazier and sees a page swirling within the twister. An immediately recognizable symbol of a trident graces his vision. Bingo. Amdar, however, is still deep in thought. He wonders if perhaps this library could hold information on that strange pulsating eye he saw before in the lair of the cultists. Just as he begins to move from his position, intending to search the massive bookshelves once more, Amdar hears a worried shout from Quinton. We need a run! Quinton calls out to his wolf elf friend as he dashes past him. In his hand is a scroll, trident stamped into it. More pertinently, behind him the big brazier roars with a deep blue flame, energy now crackling and shooting out of it. The flame licks the very top of the 90 foot tall ceiling of the great library, and a number of fizzling bolts of arcane energy begin to shoot out towards the halfling monk, a few errant bolts forking towards Amdar as well. Three bolts make their way to Quinton, who jumps on one of the tables to avoid the first before sliding under a chair to miss the second. Quinton attempts to make his way to the same open window, but the third bolt catches him in the back. Immediately, a searing jolt of pain racks his body as his hair begins to stand on end. It's extremely painful, as he was just struck by lightning. Quinton drops to the floor, and another three bolts shoot out of the brazier. He can't go on. Amdar rushes forward. Only two bolts are targeting him. He hopes he remembers his spells. He usually has to check his book for them. He throws up his arm, praying to the Saldarine. The bolts rush towards him, ready to strike, and just as they reach an arm's length away, a transparent barrier wreaths itself around Amdar, and the bolts harmlessly strike off it. Amdar is safe. He rushes over to Quinton, hoping to intercept the three bolts, but he can't make it in time. But Quinton remembers the lessons he earned from his uncle Finkin. In intense moments like these, taking a single breath is all you need to ground yourself. Quinton closes his eyes and braces, pushing past the pain, and with his eyes closed, he jumps up once more, ricocheting himself through the open window. Amdra too follows behind, though admittedly less graceful, and the pair pop out of the window, bolts fading as they leave the library. They're safe. Mike and Durden look at the pair and see their tiredness. What had just happened, they wondered. No time to explain. Let's get the scroll to that creature. Amdar lets out quickly. I still set on the magic item. He watches the window above him, and he hears the crackle of electricity still. Getting that scroll out of the party's hands would be wise. The party returns to the basement, but a seed of doubt is present in their mind. Nothing, Andre calls out. We have your scroll. Let's talk about our deal. The creature slinks out once more from the darkness. 
its one massive eye staring at the party. The voice burbles once more in their head, but is clearly more disturbed. What are you? Your pretty bones will look good with my trinkets. A look of confusion crosses the face of Durden, Quentin, and Mike. What was this creature talking about? The creature begins to gallop across the room on all fours, its head moving erratically and mouth foaming. It's insane, Umbra calls out. Don't hold back! The Nothic pounces onto Durden, clawing away at the dwarf while trying to sink its razor-sharp teeth into him. Umbra readies a bolt of flame in his hands, trying to follow the frantic movements of Durden as he pries the Nothic away from himself. Quinton rushes towards the dwarf, aiming his quarterstaff to strike the Nothic square in its jagged, crooked back. But just as the staff is brought down, Amdra loosens his bolt of flame, and the Nothic uses that to springboard off Durden. One sharp claw sticks into the ceiling of the basement, and the Nothic begins to fervently scale the ceiling, upside down. Mike clasps his holy symbol, and a bolt of radiant energy homes in on the Nothic. Immediately, the creature drops, rolling itself under one of the many tables in this room. The Nothic's insanity renders its movement more erratic and hard to track. Durden rushes forward with his axe, slamming it onto the table, bisecting the desk into two. Quinton follows that up with a punch through the splinted wood which connects, barely missing the large bulbous eye that sits in the middle of the Nothic's head. The Nothic jumps past the monk and tears into Amdar. Its clawed fingers wrap around the wizard's throat as blood begins to bead out from the tight grip. You've taken it from me. Give me my magic back. You've stolen it. You've taken it. Amdar gasps for air. The Nothic is choking him and giving no indication of letting go. Mike spots the odd face in the corner of his eye, thrumming with the latent magical glow. Get it off, Mike shouts to the other two members of the party as he runs towards the magical item. Quinton and Durden rush up to the Nothic, pummeling away at it, but its grip does not falter. Quinton brings his quarterstaff up to the back of the Nothic's head, but not before the Nothic braces its long, spindly legs and jumps away from the pair, leaving Amdar hurt, but alive. Mike grabs the vase and feels his heartbeat thrum louder than before. The inside of this vase sloshes, and he spots what looks to be a blood-red liquid. The cleric of Sesarangi holds his warhammer, and it feels energized. The Nothic spots the dragonborn holding the magical item and makes a feral dash for the cleric, claws outstretched as his eye fixates on the vase. Mike takes a hard swing, intercepting the creature, and caves in its ribs. He feels a sense of energy wash over him, but in that moment a large crack appears across the vase. The Nothic reels from the blow, staggering from the impact. Durden does not waste the moment. He rushes up to the creature and hefts his blade into its one eye. The axe sinks into the orbs, spreading a horrible ica across the room. The Nothic slinks to the floor. It's dead. The party takes a moment to themselves. The creature turned on them for seemingly no reason. Mike collects the vase he found during the fight. It seemed like he was energized by it, but it now looks more fragile than before. He suspects it may only have a few more uses before it breaks, but it may come useful in the future. What was in that scroll? asks Quintin. Amdar groggily unravels the scroll with a trident marked on it, finding a script written in Inferno, the language of the hells, the language spoken by devils. It warns the reader as it describes the methods that would be used to contact the Hells, particularly performed by opportunistic wizards and overzealous bards, those who wish to trade away their lives for the pursuit of knowledge. A chance to save his own mind, Amdra says. They look at the room around them, full of scrolls and lore, now no longer being read. We did our duty here, Durton declares. Let's find our way out. Our group of adventurers returns to Rahan, finding him chopping away at unruly bushes. Oh, you're back, Rahan says. How goes your scouting of the basement? The party purses their lips together. It was not a pleasant encounter. There was something down there, Amdar says. A Nothic, a creature corrupted by lore. We managed to defeat it. That's dreadful. I'm glad you're all safe. We'd appreciate it, brother, if you could get us that meeting with the senior archivist. Of course, I managed to squeeze in a conversation with him, and now I'll see to it that he meets you, especially after you did the university a big favor like that. He won't be available to meet any time until after sundown, though, and there's still a fair few hours till then, but it's the only time I could work you in. The party nods. At the very least, they would get their meeting. They were one step closer to reaching Mosophonus. What should we do in the meantime? Quinton asked the party. 
I mean, I wouldn't mind a bit of rest, but we have a few hours to kill. I was hoping we might rest all the way, Mike replies. Same here. I'm a bit spent, honestly. I would not be unhappy with a few moments to myself, Amdar adds. The party hankers down for an hour, but Quinton, Quinton quickly gets restless. He paces and fidgets with his quarterstaff. He knows that part of channeling his monk abilities require him to be more calm, let the key of the natural world flow over him, like a rock in a waterfall. Sometimes though, Quinton can't help but feel like he's a branch on the surface of a river, and the flow is pushing and pulling him further and further along. Come on, the halfling whines. We've only seen two things so far. I bet we could scout out more of this area. Honestly, the dwarf speaks. I'm inclined to agree. This is unfamiliar territory for all of us. I'd like to know what this place holds. Danger, probably, Amdar says. Uh, I can't say I'm not curious, but I don't know how wise it is to explore an unfamiliar place so close to the untapped wilderness. There are a number of dangers that lurk in these woods. And let's not forget that even civilization holds blackguards and vagrants. Trust me, Quinton proclaims confidently. We're in the middle of nowhere, and so close to the university. There's no harm in simply popping our heads around the corner and seeing where that takes us. Just a short walk, I swear. The rest of the party looks at the hopeful glee of Quintin. I suppose if we stick together, the danger would be minimal. Fine, let's not do anything unwise. Just head northeast for an hour, then head back. But Quintin already started moving before Mike even finished the thought. The party travels through the location they recently found out was named Wicker's Grove. It's a quaint little plot of civilization on the southern end of the Greenwood Forest. A few steads and hamlets populate the little corner of this world, but the university brings in a whole manner of new people whenever it's in session. The party eventually comes across a little farmhouse, a ranch by the looks of it, and Quinton takes the opportunity to prick up a rock as a trinket to remember his journey by. The party moves deeper and deeper northeast now inching closer to Greenwood Forest. They're beginning to be surrounded by thick trees and harsher wilderness, brambles and bushes that have never been tamed by man. Amdar shoots Mike a glance. Perhaps they should call their little expedition here before things get too untamed. Durden sniffs something in the air and begins to look overhead. Smoke in the distance. A fire so near? Hold on, Durden says with an outstretched hand. There's people nearby. Let's turn back then, Amdar says. No use risking anything. Rahan mentioned there was a druid tribe around here. What if it's them? We'd save ourselves a long journey, Quinton offers. I think we can take a look, but uh, be extra cautious. We don't want them to know we're here until we are sure they're safe. Let me do the scouting. The three of you watch my back. The party begins to carefully sneak their way over to where they see the smoke. A thick covering of trees prevents them from being seen. A large camp stands before them and a number of tents appear to be set out. Fires burn bright, and the smell of smoke is thick in the air. Durden mentally counts. There must be at least two dozen or so different people here. He crouches and stalks to underneath the tree line. He notices a man seemingly standing guard, and another approaches him, drink in hand. Durden notices both men are armed, a crossbow hangs off their sides, and a tarnished iron dagger is slid into their belts. Bandits. It has to be. We need to leave, Durden whispers as he turns back. But he notices three bandits with dead rabbits are looking over the party. So soon, one of them asks. The party draws their weapons, but one of the bandits shouts out, We have company! Durden hears as dozens of footsteps make their way out of the tent, and the distinctive sounds of crossbows being cocked rings in the air. You're outnumbered. Don't be stupid. You fight now and you die. But you let the boss see if she likes you, and uh, maybe you get to keep your alive. One of the bandits says with a smile. A glimmer of a gold tooth shines out to the party. What do we do? asks Amdar. We listen to them for now. We can't take them all on. Mike responds under his breath. The bandits march the party into the camp. Big Black Mike first, followed by Durden, Amdar, and finally Quentin. All the men have their weapons trained on the group of adventurers. The party now sees just how large this camp is. It looks like more than a dozen trees have been hacked away to make this impressive clearing. The tents all cluster around one central tent, which is remarkably larger and more grandiose than the others. In the middle of the camp, a flag of an ice-blue wolf flies. Bolri, a bandit shouts out, we have guests. 
An athletic human woman steps out from the central tent, pushing the flap aside casually. A blue bandana is wrapped around her forehead, and she has two scimitars sheathed on either side of her body. A large scar runs from her eye to over her lip. She is no doubt a grizzled warrior, and likely the captain of this bandit camp. Well, what do we have here? She says amused. A couple of rabbits lurking in the woods. We found them stalking around, Bullry. They don't look to be the firebrands or anything. Just a couple of, well, dumb wanderers. They do look well armed. The bandit who called out earlier a prize. The bandits in the camp move to flank behind their captain. There are a good 14 or so who stand behind her in a loose arc, bows trained on the party, and violence in their eyes. The bandit captain, Bolry takes a step towards the party. Remind me, boys, what do we do with rabbits? Different voices begin a cacophony from the crowd. Gut him! Stick him in the fire! Crush him with our boots! Well, my boys have spoken, haven't they? She tells the four adventurers. Seems like they want one thing, and I would be a real bad captain if I don't give it to them. Well, you are in luck, though. I have a need for a rabbit soon. She pulls out one of her scimitars and spins the blades in her hands, twirling it absentmindedly. They're great for hunting, sure, and they're easy to kill. Just one slash across the neck, and they're out. The captain raises his scimitar and points it to Big Black Mike's neck. But when you need someone to do some jumping, a rabbit is fit for the job. She lowers her blade and shoots the party a wicked smile. Oi! She turns to her men. Someone bring the girl. The bandit with the gold tooth disappears momentarily and returns grabbing a young girl from the same tent that the captain emerged from. The girl is wearing a bright red robe that is intricately embroidered. She looks to be young, barely an adolescent. Her skin is a deep tan and golden jewelry hangs from her nose and ears. Most strikingly, a large diamond is embedded in the socket for her right eye. The flesh around is inflamed, and there's a spider web of blackened veins from where the diamond sits. The girl casts her head down and lets herself be dragged by the man. Amdar is a perceptive elf, and he can tell she does not seem particularly confident or at ease in the situation. Nothing about her is very bandit-like. Why is this girl here? More importantly, why has her eye been replaced? Mike is good at reading people. He can tell that she's here against her will. Well, I'm letting you go, little rabbits, Bori smiles. But not without some payment. First, she flicks the scimitar and opens a gash across Mike's neck, which begins to pour blood. The blood gashes out from the wound and begins to pool on the ground. Bori turns to the girl. Collect it and do the ritual. The rest of you keep an eye on them until she finishes. They try anything, kill them. The girl gets harmed, kill yourselves before telling me, because I won't make your deaths easy. The captain turns to the party one last time. Well, give my men an excuse to kill you. It'll boost morale around here. If you do decide, however, to keep your gold and your lives, don't forget that from today, you're mine, little rabbits. With that, Bull returns to leave, and a few men see that as a cue to follow suit. A good half dozen, however, are still trained in the party. They watch as the girl with the diamond eye begins to pull out a tiny number of glass vials, one for each of their captives, each vial no bigger than her pinky finger, and a tiny dagger resting in her other hand, no bigger than a letter opener, and her hand trembles as she begins to collect the blood of Mike. She pricks each party member with her dagger and nervously collects the blood in the tiny vials. Quinton knows the situation's not right. He can't let this girl have their blood. He doesn't know much about magic, but even he can tell that something terrible will happen if their blood reaches the hand of that bandit captain. He suddenly indicates to Durden and Amdar to, to make a distraction. Amdar places a hand behind him and suddenly casts their minor illusion spell. The kind of spell that children use to learn magic with, but not a spell that isn't effective by any means. The bandits turn their head as a large hawk caws overhead. In the split second he has, Quinton, who himself is only barely taller than the girl, swipes the vials from her hand. She's about to yelp, but Quinton stares at her fiercely, intimidating the young girl. She turns her head to the floor. She quickly slinks away from Quinton. Alright, get out of here, one bandit shouts to them. Count yourselves lucky that the next job we need got more bodies, else we would have killed you and had your stuff to ourselves by now. The bandits laugh to each other. One of them fires a shot that lands directly in front of the party. Oops, my finger slipped. 
Let's see to it. We don't all do that now, do we, boys? Uh, the raucous laughter behind them as the party turns and runs. It would be best not to stick around. Once they're a good distance away, Durden slams his fist against the tree, frustrated. By Morden's beard, what in the Allfather was that? A bad decision is what it was, Amdar says. He thinks to himself, your bad decision. I don't know why exactly our blood was taken, but that cannot be a good omen. Who knows what horrible things can be done with it? Mike says aghast. Don't worry, Kundan says with a wink as he clinks the four wilds he palmed against each other. I don't think they got it. You swiped them, but how? Durden asks. My feet aren't the only thing nimble about me, Quinton says. That was a bad situation for all of us to be in, Amdar pants. A situation that could have been avoided if we stayed put in the university. Aw, oh, come on now, that was an adventure, Amdar, Quinton exclaimed. We're all alive and unharmed. Quinton spots Mike's wound. Well, mostly unarmed. Luck, more than anything, Amdar argues. That could have been exceptionally worse. But it wasn't, Durden says. Let's count our victories where they lie. I've been in too many battles with close encounters to dwell on what-ifs. Hmm, I don't know if I can agree with that, Mike chimes. He utters a quick holy word and magically closes the wound where Bolri had cut him. It still hurt. I can't allow myself to be unwary while my holy mission awaits me. Where is the adventure in life without a little bit of, you know... Random chance and luck guiding us, Quinton asks. <sighs> Amdar sighs. It's getting late. Let's just see to it that we make it back in time to talk to the senior archivist. Let's not squander the opportunity we have with him. The journey back to the university is a quick one, with the party not detouring like they were before. They had been burned by that mistake. They spot Rahan waiting near the stone tower. Ah, you're here. Brilliant. We just need to step on this pad. Uh, Rahan led them to a green circle etched on the ground. Amdar opens his eyes in surprise. A teleportation circle. This is great magic. Each member of the room starts to feel a lurch in their stomach, and they're suddenly phased into a completely different area. The office was surprisingly tiny. A simple desk sat in the room, and behind it a gnomish man with deep blue, long hair, and a neatly trimmed beard was in the process of pruning through a stack of documents. His thick rim glasses scan over each page, and a floating quill seems to correct the documents as he goes over them. Hello? Amdar asks. Are you the senior archivist? Belatedly, and as if all life had been sapped out of him, the man behind the desk responded, Yes, that's me. We wanted to ask about a guide through Greenwood Forest. Uh, we hear it's dangerous, and we all need to make our way to Mesophonus. Not much I can tell you. Go talk to the druids. Is that all? Duridan asks. Unless you have further questions, the man says that he has just his glasses. You must be joking. We came a long way to ask you this. You can only offer us a five-word reply. There's nothing I can do for you here. You'll find the druids south of the university. That's somewhat helpful, but could you not spare some more information? Perhaps a guide from the university? I'm capable of divulging information. I can't provide you with a guide, however. Can't you tell us anything? What are the dangers of Greenwood? Many threats occupy the forest. Woodland beasts, particularly spiders, green trolls, potentially a green dragon. The party felt very underwhelmed here. Can't you give us anything? We cleared a Nothic from the basement for you. Bothersome creatures. Ultimately a nuisance we deal with regularly. We usually send our staff to do so. I cannot compensate you since you're not an Archivist University member. Are you serious? You've been extremely unhelpful here. I've offered you all that I can. I'm afraid our time here is running short. The party stood in place, stubbornly refusing not to move. The senior archivist had not given them anything to work with. <sighs> he sighed. He flicked his wrist and the party saw as the quill floating above the senior archivist dropped out of the air. A moment after that, a large wall of stone was erected between the party and the desk, separating them from the archivist. The party was mad. Quinton used his knowledge of key, and with his ability to mold the earth itself, he molded a middle finger onto the wall. He hoped the archivist would see it. The party made their way back to the green circle on the opposite side of the room and were quickly teleported back down. Rahan waited there with a smile on his face. Well, did you get what you wanted? Amda sneered, Quinton harumphed, and Mike walked past the man. Durden offered him a sad smile. Thank you for the help, brother. I'm afraid we didn't learn much. He patted his fellow dwarf on the shoulder and made his way to the party. Hopefully, they all thought to themselves. We'll have more luck with that druid tribe. <laughs>